Hello. Today I want to answer a question that may be on several unbelievers' minds, maybe even on the minds of some uh, churchgoers. I want to answer the question why it is so important uh, for believers in Jesus Christ to congregate physically together. Uh, it is uh, vital to us. And uh, some people probably hear that and think, during this COVID-19 crisis, that's crazy. But I want to give you a little bit of understanding why that is the case. The coronavirus quarantine has caused fear to run rampant within society. Uh, one fellow said that uh, allergy season has turned into the Salem witch trials. One sneeze and you might be shot. Uh, fear has often caused human beings to attempt to destroy uh, things that they don't understand. And the witch trials were actually an example of that during that time. People misinterpreted scripture in order to eliminate those people who were dissimilar to them. Ironically enough, today in some areas of the country, there is a similar feeling toward true Christianity. There's a similar feeling that we need to eradicate and move this religious freedom out of the way. Uh, with the coronavirus on the rise, other citizens just simply don't understand Christians' great desire to assemble. To the irreligious mindset, they imagine that it's kind of insane to gather and it's dangerous to the community. Uh, whether it be in cars, whether they be six feet apart, even though the local Walmart is still open with people crowding inside, the Lowe's is getting uh, gathered together, uh, they don't understand why this church seems like that is the place where all the disease must rest. Uh, they don't understand why Christians would be so concerned about not meeting physically during this time. In some parts of the country, it would seem there is a mindset by some governors that the main place the coronavirus spread is actually in the church setting. I am thankful that the governor of our state, Governor Bill Lee, has stated that churches are an essential service and must continue through this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, he is, uh, of course, the stay-at-home order uh, keeps us to 10 people or less within the buildings. But uh, we have sought very interesting and new methods and ways to reach people. Uh, this is what WATE, a local television channel, had to say about it. Worship services are considered an essential activity, and the Safer at Home order does not close places of worship. Governor Lee has encouraged churches to choose alternative methods, like virtual gatherings or drive-in services where appropriate social distancing is practiced. Other states have not considered churches to be an essential service, and as a matter of fact, they've sought every way they can to close them down during this time. CBN reported uh, several examples. The threat to American religious freedom and free speech are among several guaranteed rights that have been the subject of much debate due to the COVID-19 pandemic amid the result stay-at-home orders issued by several states. In the latest example, a federal judge blocked a Kansas order limiting in-person attendance at religious services to 10 people or less. The First Baptist Church in Dodge City and Calvary Baptist Church in Junction City filed a lawsuit on Thursday, arguing that the order violates their religious freedom and free speech rights, according to the Associated Press. The lawsuit indicates that members of both churches sat six feet apart in accordance with social distancing guidelines and took additional steps like not passing around offering or communion plates. The state does not have a compelling reason for prohibiting church service where congregants can otherwise practice adequate social distancing protocol, the lawsuit said. Governor Laura Kelly issued the order to enforce social distancing requirements, but U.S. District Judge John Brooms believes that might be a violation of the First Amendment. The judge wrote in his decision, churches and religious activities appear to have been singled out among essential functions for stricter treatment. The judge's ruling will remain in effect until May 2nd, one day before the state's stay-at-home order is set to expire. In another example, CBN News reported that Mendocino County in Northern California is prohibiting churches from streaming worship, singing, and playing wind instruments during online church services unless the worship originates from individual residences. Doesn't this seem petty? 
The order issued by the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors says no singing or use of wind instruments, harmonicas, or other instruments that could spread COVID-19 through projected droplets shall be permitted unless the recording of the event is done at one's residence and involving only the member of one's household or living unit because of the increased risk of transmission of COVID-19. And any violation of the order is classified as a misdemeanor punishable by fine, imprisonment, or both. The county's ban on worship teams ends on May 10th and includes venues such as concert halls, auditoriums, churches, temples, and playhouses, and says only four individuals may be present for the live event. All others must participate remotely. Another prominent example involved a mayor in Mississippi whose police officers gave out tickets to churchgoers who attended drive through church worship services where they stayed in their cars. CBN News previously reported that the members of Temple Baptist Church in Greenville, Mississippi, were fined $500 each for sitting in their own cars in the church parking lot while listening to their pastor's sermon broadcast over the radio. Greenville Mayor Eric Simmons issued an order requiring all church buildings to be closed for both in-person and drive-in church services due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Attorney, Attorney Jeremy Dyes with the First Liberty Institute said Simmons aid aims to single out and target churches. Mayor Simmons was repeatedly pressed about whether churches who abide by the CDC guidelines and host drive-in church will face the specter of the police arriving on the scene to disperse those peaceably assembled to, in worship. Rather than reassure his churches that this will not happen, the mayor reaffirmed his unlawful order, Dice argued. The mayor continues to single out and target the churches of Greenville. The mayor announced on April 13th that members of the Temple Baptist Church would not have to pay the $500 ticket they were issued at the April 8th drive-in church service. So they don't have to pay that $500 fine. That's great. So why this bend towards uh, attacking the First Amendment? Maybe you don't even know what our First Amendment of our Constitution is. It is the basis of our freedom here in America. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of peace, people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, this is the foundation of our country, but it's also the foundation of the local church. You see, we have a history of gathering when people tell us not to. It's because uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the highest authority, and he's told us to come together. It is the very essence of who we are as Christians that we physically assemble. And right now we're doing this virtually. We're doing it a little bit differently. I'm going to explain why we have chosen to do that. Uh, But before that, I want to tell you about another Christian, a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian, and he was a, a great man. 1930s, he wrote down this statement. He said, a Christian who stays away from the assembly is a contradiction of terms. Bonhoeffer lived during the times of Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany, of course, we know now, uh, tried to stop Christianity. It tried to stop everybody. It tried to take over the world. It even uh, definitely tried to stop the Jewish people by marching them into ovens to have them eradicated because they were of an impure breed, according to Hitler. During that time, uh, Hitler also sought to put uh, Bonhoeffer's books on the banned list in in Germany. Uh, Bonhoeffer lost his license to teach at the university. And uh, this was because Bonhoeffer uh, played a key role in what was called the Confessing Church in Germany. There was the Confessing Church and there was the National Church. The National Church, uh, the church given to Germany by Luther, uh, had chosen to endorse the Nazi party. They got behind them and they confessed their allegiance to the Nazi party. Well, the Confessing Church did no such thing. They confessed their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Bonhoeffer believed, even after all these things happened back in 1935, that someday Germany would survive the Nazis and someday Germany would need to be rebuilt. And therefore, he had great faith in this uh, confessing church. Uh, Though he had had a chance to escape Germany, and he actually did, went to New York and different things, he returned back to his church 
his church in Germany. I mean, he could have went to church in New York. He could have been safe, but he chose to put himself in danger to go back to his church. He was thrown in prison where he kept company with them, preached daily uh, in the different workplaces they would take them and uh, in the, the horror of being in, in a jail during Nazi Germany's reign. And finally, on April 9th, 1945, he was taken outside and hung by Nazi Germany. Did Bonhoeffer feel a need to be with his church? Yes. Yes, he did. And all true believers do. They long for the company of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, let's see why. Let, let's, let's not just look at the outside, this, these people from history. Let's not just look at uh, how people feel today. Let's see why the authority, that's, that's this word of God. Uh, you can say you had a word from God, but folks, if it don't agree with the word of God, it ain't the word of God, okay? Uh, let's look at the word of God and let's see why Christians desire to be together, real Christians. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, our public testimony is shown by our gathering together. It's always been that way. When the disciples gathered together, they were making a statement that they were with Jesus Christ. When they were taken by the Pharisees back during that time and beaten and whipped and told, don't you go out publicly and preach the name of Jesus anymore. They said, we cannot but go out and speak of him. Uh, for he is God, right? He had given them the word of truth and they had to speak it out in public. So it is a public example. It's our public testimony. It says there in verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that it promised. The profession of our faith is a public profession. If you're professing in a corner somewhere, you ain't professed your faith. It's public. It's out there. <laughs> People hear it. Uh, they know that you are a believer. And nowhere in the Bible is there this idea of a lone wolf Christian. There was a a fad that went through the church a while back that said, well, you don't really have to go to church. You don't really have to go assemble. You can just have church out in the wild. You can just have church here or there. Well, folks, uh, the reality is this. Um, if you're a Christian, you're going to publicly profess your faith by coming among the other believers. You're not a lone wolf. Next, it says, the assembling of the believers provokes us. What does it provoke us to do? Well, according to uh, this next verse, it says, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. First of all, love. I've been reading through a book by C.S. Lewis called The Four Loves. And uh, one of the different loves, he says love is not just, uh, in our English language, there's just love, that word, right? But in Greek, it, it breaks into all sorts of beautiful, different understanding of relationship between human beings. And one of the relationships is friendship. When the group gets together and they have one mindset together, they become closer together. There is a community that is created in a local church with people physically meeting together. They learn how to get along with one another and they become close friends because they have a similar purpose. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, let us have the mind of Christ. That's what brings us all together is that mindset that the Holy Spirit is with us and that love is seen between the brethren within the church. And this is a place that is supposed to provoke us unto love and not only that, to good works. Uh, God said, uh, the, the word says in Ephesians 2.10 that God uh, has foreordained that we should do uh, good works through Christ, right? And the church does that. It helps people. There's many different organizations helping people during this time through the churches. And not only that, they've been doing it for a long, long time. Our churches gather little uh, boxes every year and we send them off to children in other countries so they can have a Christmas. That's a good work. Uh, we help people when, when they come through and they need a little help. We help them out. We have uh, helped people many different ways 
But we wouldn't do that if we weren't a local body of believers. We are the church. We gather together. We provoke one another to love and good works. Not only that, but it also says there in verse 25 that we are to exhort one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. We exhort, we encourage one another. There is a special encouragement that you will only find by sitting down in a church with other believers, hearing their testimony, hearing the words of uh, uh, of faith, uh, hearing them pray, hearing the, the message being preached among the others, it, it, it is an exhorting experience. It encourages us to go out and share the truth ourselves, to live what God has said we are. Not only that, it's a place to remind us of the future. Uh, when we meet physically, when we gather, as it says here, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, we do this even the more as we see the day approaching. What day is that? It's the day of the Christ, day of Christ. It's the day of the Lord, the, the end of all things. As we draw closer to that, we're reminded each Sunday, we're reminded that the Lord rose again, right? When we meet in that way, we're reminded uh, that uh, there's coming a day when we'll be worshiping in heaven with him. We're reminded that there's coming a day when there's going to come a judgment upon this earth. And these things encourage us even the more so to gather together, to have our minds set about heaven instead about the things of this world. Many of you may have gotten your mind about the things of this world while we've been uh, separated from one another because we've not been together to exhort one another as we see the day approaching. Our mindset gets more towards the world. You know, I've seen this many a times. Many people get out of church and their mindset will get around the idea that, you know, like everybody else thinks. And uh, when you come back to that church, it brings you back into the proper mindset. Boy, I tell you what, isn't this, this Bible just so contemporary to today to tell us exactly the things that we're feeling as we're going through this? So you see, it's, it's, it's a command. We must physically assemble together. God is, has given this command to us, and we are trying to do that during this time in the best ways we can. Um, and it's very difficult. Uh, so why have we chosen to go around this virtual route at this time? Well, if the government had attempted to force us not to assemble, we would have to re rebel. That's just uh, how it is, folks. That's just what we, there's a higher authority than this government of this world. But that isn't the kind of situation we're dealing with here. The scriptures also say that we are to love our neighbor. And uh, in the midst of this pandemic, we believe this pandemic is real. We don't believe this is some uh, persecution on the church from the higher government. We believe that some parts of the government obviously are persecuting the church, is seeking ways to do that by the article I read. But we don't believe the main point of this is to create uh, a persecution and halt, halt the churches at this time. And we're commanded to love our neighbor. And that means that uh, it might be a better witness for us not to show up in that way and to take contact uh, through uh, phone calls, through uh, video, as I'm doing right now, until this uh, pandemic allows us to meet again. But that's one thing I want to point out here. You know, we've never had this opportunity with technology to meet with one another like this. I mean, the disciples back during that time did not have a phone. They did not have uh, uh, the ability to put video up. They didn't have these types of things. But this is not the end. This is not the new uh, way of things. Folks, we're going to meet again. We're going to come back to our local church and we're going to worship. We're going to lift him up. We're going to love on one another again. We're going to shake hands uh, at the appropriate time. We're going to come together. We're going to physically meet again because that's what our Lord has commanded us to do. I don't know when the exact date of that will be safe for us to do, but we will do it. We'll, we'll continue to love our neighbors during this time. We'll continue to be a good witness to our neighbors in that by by using this technology to connect with one another. But make no mistake, I just want to make very clear, this isn't the substitute. This isn't how you should think church is. Church is coming and meeting with the body of believers. 
That's always what it is. That's always what it will be because that's the way our Lord intended it. And we look forward to the day when we can physically meet together and worship with you at Omega Baptist Church. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 10.30 and 6.30 p.m. I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's all about Jesus, my friend, and we pray that we may be able to have the opportunity to share with you personally the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ.